part two. Number five, spell everything out for the audience. When you take Star Trek and try and make it work for everyone, not just nerds, you unfortunately have to spell it out for them using imagery they can recognize and associate with so that they're not totally confused. This is where the movie starts to lose its attachment to Star Trek and it becomes Space Adventure Film, set in the future of space. There are a lot of little things in the film like this, but I'm going to focus on four main ones. Number one, Starfleet Academy. The location is right, the look is right, but the feel is wrong. If you show Starfleet the way it's typically portrayed, people in the audience would ask, What is this, like some kind of resort? Or... Is this like some kind of weird cult? What's going on? Or, why is everyone wearing clothes at this weird San Francisco New Age nudist colony? You see, Starfleet is a military academy. Academy comes from the word academics. It's not where enlisted men go. You could just enlist in Starfleet if you want and perform some kind of task and become like a petty officer or just a regular crewman, but you'd have no rank. You see, Starfleet is to West Point, as the base in Starship Troopers is to Camp Lejeune. Now this is a very mild point I'm making, and I'm trying not to nitpick, because I do like this movie. But I also like to analyze things. In Star Trek, not all members of Starfleet went to the Academy. They're not bridge officers, they haven't made to Starfleet Academy. They're engineers. The Academy was for the best and the brightest, and it was actually pretty hard to get into. I didn't get into the Academy. I failed you, and I failed the Enterprise. The way that it's portrayed in Star Trek is like everyone enlists and then they get shipped off to war. Kind of like Vietnam. Now this is all just semantics, but Pike encourages Kirk to enlist in Starfleet, not to apply to Starfleet Academy. Enlist in Starfleet. Enlist. <laughs> they mention that Kirk's test scores are off the chart because he's indeed a genius like all the other characters, but the movie blurs the line a little when it comes to the military aspects of Starfleet. For example, they show the cupcake guy and his buddies as cadets. Somehow I doubt this guy passed the exam and was accepted into the academy. Especially when it seemed like his lifelong dream was to point a gun at people. I would guess that most security guards were just crewmen and not officers. The rougher, more militaristic environment, though, helps the audience understand what's happening. That Kirk and his friends are all on the bottom of the food chain and starting out their careers in Starfleet. At times, I feel like Starfleet is made up of space marines. You understand what the Federation is, don't you? It's important. It's a peacekeeping and humanitarian armada. Nice try. Two, Enterprise Construction. Starships typically aren't built at Earth or on the ground, for this matter. They were usually built at a facility called Utopia Planitia, orbiting Mars. But remember, this segment is called Spelling It Out for People. By changing this detail, it allowed for scenes of Kirk to see his destiny in the distance. It was metaphorical and visual. You see, J.J. Abrams deals more in visuals and emotions of the moment. More so than the complete accuracy of all the technical stuff. This is why this movie butts heads with a lot of Star Trek fans. Let me give you a quick example and see if it bothered you. Or if you even noticed it at all. So all the cadets land inside the shuttle bay area of the ship. Spock is there too because he presumably came up on a shuttle with the rest of them. So Spock leaves the shuttle bay and we follow him inside a turbo lift. He grabs the handle and in like less than 5 seconds or so he's already up on the bridge. Now the bridge is pretty far away from the shuttle bay. Normally there's horizontal and vertical turbo lift shafts that run inside a starship. So in this scene, Kirk, Spock, and Scotty take a turbo lift ride up to the bridge from engineering, which is actually closer than the shuttle bay. Let's watch. Well, impossible, Captain. The power source is protected by a material we cannot breach, even with our phasers. Mr. Scott and I have prepared the means for the only logical alternative available to us. What alternative? The barrier we must penetrate is composed of negative energy. I have opened the control valves to the matter-antimatter nacelles. On your signal, I will flood them with positive energy. What? When we engage the barrier, 
the ship will explode. The Kelvins will be stopped here. And so will we. Are you mad? I can't just... Even in the next generation times, the turbo lift took a while. And when you hear that sound, that means it's changing over from one shaft to the next. Now, did the creators of the movie know how far the shuttle bay is from the bridge? Gee, I hope so. Did they care? Nope. Here's why. It's because this movie is all about fluidity. It's about emotion and adventure. The style is fast paced, the camera movements are free and flowing, and you're meant to be filled with a sense of adventure. Hey, wait a minute. The Enterprise was being built in Iowa? Right where Kirk happened to live? Talk about convenience. So wait, this movie fucking sucks! Three, the Kobayashi Maru test. Hmm. Arm photons, prepare to fire on the Klingon warbirds. Yes, sir. Jim, their shields are still up. Are they? Okay, we got it. You rigged the test. No, they're not. Fire on all enemy ships. One photon each you do. Let's not waste ammunition. Yep, I got Target it. Target locked and acquired on all warbirds. Let me guess, you, you did something to the test, right? All ships destroyed, Captain. Begin rescue of the stranded crew. Thank you for so. telling me what's going on in an over-exaggerated caricature. Can you make it any more obvious for the audience? Wait, the original use of the Kobayashi Maru test was to show that Kirk never wanted to lose, right? And then he had to deal with losing? What's the point of the test this time? The purpose is to experience fear. To experience fear? How do you experience fear for real when you know it's a simulation? And then you got a Hura clowning around in the background. We are receiving a distress signal from the USS Kobayashi Maru. Hey, quit Maru. clowning around back there. I'm trying to experience fear. In the next gen, they do a similar test on Wesley Crusher when he's applying for Starfleet Academy. You see, they make him think he's waiting for some kind of test in a room, and then an unrelated accident occurs elsewhere in the building. Wesley is then forced to make a life or death decision all on his own. Point is, he thought what was happening was real. Now that was a test. But in this movie, the purpose of the test was really just to have Kirk meet Spock. They could have just met inside a Kmart, but they slapped in some kind of generic notion that this test was about fear. And yet you were the one who said fear was necessary for command. I mean, did, did you see his ship? Do you see what he did? Of course you got to experience fear. What do you need to take a test for about that? For the engine room. Lastly, what was my favorite Star Trek idea and set location has now been altered so that normal people know what's happening. You see, a starship is powered by something called a warp core. It's a really tall tube thing that extends up many decks, and in the middle it houses a matter and antimatter reaction chamber that powers the warp drive. Technology in the future is pretty clean and sterile, actually, and you almost can't tell that it's an engine room. Again, if people saw something like that, they'd say, Is that a giant frozen margarita dispenser? Or, Where is this supposed to be? Why did the movie stop thinking for me? So now the Enterprise engine room looks pretty similar to a modern day cruise ship, making it very clear that we're now in the engine room. Now I do appreciate the fact that they took the effort to film in real locations, rather than sit on their ass and film people in front of a blue screen and have it end up looking like fucking crap. But I get the vibe that these scenes and others were filmed in some kind of like water reclamation facility, or, or like an oil refinery, or fermentation plant, or something like that. The warp cores look suspiciously like tanks they brew beer in. If this is true though, when they shot the unimportant locations in real locations to like save money or whatever, well, then that's kind of horrible, isn't it? Do they have to go back to the same location every time they shoot a sequel? What if they can't get in that location again? What if it goes out of business because of the economy? Or what if it gets knocked down by a tornado? They'll have to build a set that looks just like it, when they should have just built a set in the first place. Eh. They'll probably just shoot the engineering scenes inside the kitchen of a Chick-fil-A. The new warp drive will be like the fry cooker. Hot plasma coming through! Now I would be negligent in not mentioning things that they kept the same and that I like. For example, I like the transporter room. 
the transportation process and the look of everything. I think it's kind of neat actually. Same with the view screen. I like how it's a combination of window and view screen. If you think about it, it would have been really helpful in a situation like this. Also, the new ship design is pretty cool, and I like the way that they jump into warp drive. It's very much like Star Wars Hyperspace, and it has a real kind of adventurous feel to it. Let's punch it. It's really hard for me to say nice things about a movie. So at this moment, I'm sticking a fork in my balls. Number six, more stuff about sex. Who's got a case of the not gays? So there wasn't really time to give Kirk a love interest. The dude just had too much shit to do. So we have to establish him as a ladies man, right? Because his future reputation precedes him. Wait a minute, that don't make no sense. Anywho, Kirk makes a pass at Uhura. Tries to sleep with the green lady, and is always craning his neck at anything female that walks by. Establishing that the galactic ladies man James T. Kirk has a case of the not gays is not too difficult. But then you got Spock. All anybody knows about Spock is that he's weird, he's quiet, and he likes science. He also likes looking into some blue thing. But in a film that's hypercharged with sex and flashy lens flares and aimed at a general audience, you better deal with the subject of Spock's sexuality, or else people will just wonder if he's a gay. So since they basically had nothing for her to do after she figured out the transmission thing... Captain, we're being hailed. The logical approach was to have her and Spock involved in some kind of weird, creepy sex thing. Now technically it was Nurse Chapel that had the real hidden feelings for Spock. I'm in love with you, Mr. Spock. Uhura just liked to tease Spock and kind of make fun of him. Why don't you tell me I'm an attractive young lady? Or ask me if I've ever been in love? Inside her head, you know she was always thinking, Crazy weird ass cracker. The pairing of Spock and Uhura made little sense, other than the fact that she was indeed sleeping with him to get ahead, which is heavily implied in this next scene. And did I not on multiple occasions demonstrate an exceptional oral sensitivity? And I quote. Did she just say she demonstrated oral sensitivity on multiple occasions? What does she mean by that? So maybe she just used him to get on board the Enterprise, and in the next film she's gonna break his heart by fucking that green thing. I mean, you kinda get the impression that she really cares for him, but it's hard to tell what her motives are. I just don't get what she sees in Spock. Spock is like this boring, creepy asshole. I am instructing you to accept the fact that I- Anywho, this strangely tacked on love subplot serves two purposes. One, to give Uhura something more to do in the story. Captain, we're being hailed. And two, to show that Spock's got a big case of the not gaze. You pound that mound, my friend. Take it at warp speed. But don't forget to vulcanize your nacelle. Next up, we got an older doctor guy named Bones, who for some reason wants to pal around with Kirk all the time. Study my ass. Now the audience immediately starts thinking that he wants to climb Chris's pine tree. Now before we get too far here, we've Where got to... Go, -wife. Oh thank god, he finally said something about a wife. This was also an opportunity to explain his nickname to people, and that it had nothing to do with a boner. All I got left is my bones. Bones is of course an old timey term for a doctor. I think it comes from like the Civil War or something, when doctors were called old sawbones because they would cut off your limbs to avoid the gangrene. But, because people don't know nothing about history or anything else no more, Bones' nickname is now simplified for the stupid masses. Hey, anybody want to go get a double down with me? It's that time of day when I have to shove food in my fucking face. So they used this opportunity to kill two birds with one stone, to show that Bones ain't a gay, and to explain his nickname. Efficiency. I love it. Next we meet Scotty, and we find out that he lives on an ice planet by himself with a little green goblin that loves him. Now this is pretty fucking weird, right? Now you're probably wondering if this Scotty likes it in Jeffrey's tube or not. Does he have an infection of the not gaze that must be treated? She is one well-endowed lady. I'd like to get my hands on her ample nacelles in your pardon the engineering parlance. Oh, he said something about tits. 
That's good enough for me. Next is Chekhov. Eh, whatever. And we all know about Sulu, don't we? Your hair is like my <laughs> Oh my god. Don't forget about Nero. You'd think that a bunch of bald, sweaty men living together on a dimly lit factory ship for 25 years is weird. Yeah, it certainly is. But the movie even takes the time to establish that Nero's got a case of the not gays too. Provide for myself and the wife who's expecting my child. Wait a minute, the timeline just changed again. Bambi's alive again in this timeline. Except for now she's my first cat. Oh, I'm so confused. Number seven, the story. And things that don't make sense. Now that all that's been said, I could finally talk about the story which isn't as important of a topic as you might have thought. So yeah, this story is basically like Star Trek Nemesis. A big, powerful evil ship, Romulans, and revenge. But in this movie it was alright. In Nemesis it wasn't. Here's why. By the time we got to the Next Generation films, we already know the TNG crew. These movies were desperately begging for a slow-moving, well-written plot. Instead, we had dumb villains and doomsday devices and a 65-year-old man trying to be Bruce Willis. In Star Trek, so much time is needed to establish the characters and how they all get into place, you don't have time to have a super complex villain and story. I mean, I guess you could have pulled it off. Maybe. But why take the risk and fuck up the first film right out of the gate? Ah, but let's discuss the plot anyway. So the movie starts out with Kirk's mother giving birth to him. Again, the super dramatic opening hooks people in. Is it cheap and easy? Yes. Does it work? Yes. So why was a nine-month pregnant civilian on a starship? I don't know. Maybe they were on a long, deep space assignment and she was actually a fellow officer who got knocked up during the mission. Point is, she picked a pretty bad time to go into labor. Why can't women do anything right? Okay, so some star somewhere went supernova and threatened to destroy the galaxy. A star will explode and threaten to destroy the galaxy. Huh? The whole galaxy? That must have been a big supernova. Aren't there like billions of stars in our own galaxy and this kind of thing happens all the time? Ah, whatever. You see, they once tried to base Star Trek in actual science. The technical advisors on Star Trek The Next Generation constantly check the latest data compiled by NASA and other science institutions to ensure the technical accuracy of the series. Uh, nah, fuck that now. <sighs> Look, I have to stop here. It's a good time to point out something really important. What's important is that these kind of scientific things no longer really matter in the new Star Trek. And me discussing them is utterly pointless. When reviewing the Star Wars prequels, I was reviewing them on the fact that they failed as films first. Films that didn't quite connect with the audience. The technical details of Star Wars and how that universe works doesn't really matter because it's science fantasy, not science fiction. Star Trek was always based more in real scientific stuff rather than pure fantasy. I'll give you an example. In Star Trek, a great deal of time was devoted to the warp engines and how they worked. Matter, antimatter, reaction, the function of dilithium crystals, how and why a warp field was created, and so on. Countless episodes deal with this subject matter, and a ton of stories in Star Trek are centered all around these ideas and concepts. In Star Wars, spaceship engines served one purpose. They get characters from here to there. We're never told how they work. How hyperspace works, what fuels the engines, etc. Luke just flies from Hoth to Dagobah and X-Wing. No biggie. Whatever. None of it really mattered. What mattered in Star Wars is the story, the adventures, and the emotions. It's a pretty clear-cut example of the difference between the two. Science fiction and science fantasy. Not to say that Star Trek didn't also deal in characters, adventure, and emotion, but the series was more heavily based in the technical nuances of how things work. Matter, antimatter, mixture ratio settings, and optimum balance, reaction sequence, corresponding to specified norms, magnetic plasma transfer to warp field generators, or programmed specs. Punch it. It's what separated Star Trek from Star Wars, and what gave Star Trek the more nerdy stigma. 
With the new Star Trek movie, there was a notable attempt to make the film more like Star Wars, and that really comes through. Let's punch it. So the truth is, you have to learn to set aside the Star Trek mindset and look at this new movie from a whole different perspective. When you do that, you could kind of enjoy it. It's like looking at one of those magic eye things. My wife once sent me a message from beyond the grave in one of those magic eye things when I was looking at one in the bookstore. It said, I will not rest until I see you prosecuted for my murder. Anyway, the movie does vaguely reference some of the old Star Trek concepts and ideas, but it's all just in some kind of non-technical fantasy way. You see, in my opinion, where the prequels utterly failed, Star Trek excelled. Star Trek is really engaging. It's fun, adventurous, fast-paced. Heroes are heroes, and villains are villains. And at the very least, you know what's happening. It's everything we did not get in the prequels. At no point were we completely bored and confused. I can't lock on your signal. You're moving too fast. I can do that. I can do that. Thanks, the gun. Hi, sir. Black hole's expanding. We won't reach minimum safe distance if we don't leave immediately. Hold on. Hold on. Compensating gravitational pull. Highness, with your permission, we're heading for a remote planet called Tatooine. It's in a system far beyond the reach of the truck. In fact, J.J. Abrams should have directed the prequels, and George Lucas should have directed people to their seats in the theater. But anyway... Back to bitching about the technical details in the new Star Trek movie. So Spock is sent to stop the supernova from destroying Romulus by using something called red matter to create a black hole to suck up the supernova before it destroys the planet. Wow, and you thought your job at PetSmart was hard. Anyway, Spock is late, he fucks it up, and then still sucks up the supernova anyway. Hey wait, if all Spock needed was a tiny blob of red matter to make a black hole, and there was only, like, one supernova? Then why did he bring so much red matter? Also, such material would probably be really valuable to space terrorists. So some security would have been good. A few more Vulcan ships, maybe. So was the lightning storm in space kind of near Romulus, or in the Federation's territory? I don't know what's happening. We've received a distress call from Vulcan. Okay, Vulcan sends out a distress signal and Starfleet sends a bunch of ships there. What appeared to be a lightning storm in space. Soon after, Starfleet received a distress signal from the Vulcan High Command. Because Vulcan says they're having seismic activities. That their planet was experiencing seismic activity. And they attribute this to the lightning storm in space. So wait, the lightning storm in space that's near the Klingon neutral zone is causing seismic activity all the way on Vulcan? Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. And not anywhere else, or was it worse? Closer to it? Unless Nero sent a phony distress signal as a trap, like Kirk said. We're warping into a trap, sir. The right, one. I already said that. But if Nero's goal was to blow up all the Federation planets... That is why I will destroy all the remaining Federation planets, starting with yours. Then why would he want a bunch of ships attacking him when he was trying to do it? I need the subspace frequencies of Starfleet's border protection grids. Oh. Well, maybe he wanted them there so he could get the border protection codes from one of the captains. You know, so he could attack Earth next? But if that were the case, then why did he destroy the whole fleet? Sir, there's another Federation ship! Destroy it, too! He was even gonna destroy the Enterprise, too, until he saw that it was the ship the Spock was on. Wait a minute, what the heck planet is he on where he could see Vulcan in the sky that big? Is it a Vulcan moon? Vulcan has no moon. Oh, I guess not. But if these planets are that close to each other, then why is the one planet a frozen wasteland while Vulcan is a hot desert planet? They just, like, made this planet up because they needed it for the story, right? Ah, Star Wars mindset. Keep focused. Stay in the Star Wars mindset. 
Maybe I just need another vodka gimlet. Oh, fuck. Now, Spock just says that a star went supernova, right? 129 years from now, a star will explode. I assume it wasn't the Romulan sun, because it would have blowed up Romulus in like one millisecond. If it was a distant star, then it probably would have taken the supernova like years to reach Romulus. Do they know how much distance is in between stars? I don't know where things are happening. Also, young Spock hypothesizes that a black hole could be used to create a time travel portal, right? Such technology could theoretically be manipulated to create a tunnel through space-time. So I would assume that old Spock knew this too. It was his red matter. So how did the Vulcans know for sure that the black hole would just absorb the supernova and not send it through time? Did they test this out on a different supernova? Or was it all theoretical? It's a pretty big risk to take, assholes. Maybe Romulus was meant to be destroyed by the natural course of events of this galaxy. Remember when Data wanted to save that little girl? When Picard said leave, let her whole family die? When their whole planet started erupting in volcanoes because it wasn't his job to interfere with the natural course of events of their planet? There are no options. The Prime Directive is not a matter of degrees, it is an absolute. So we make an exception in the deaths of millions. See, the Prime Directive has many different functions, not the least of which is to protect us. To prevent us from allowing our emotions to overwhelm our judgment. I promised the Romulans that I would save their planet. What we do today may profoundly affect the future. If we could see every possible outcome, we'd be gods, which we're not. If there is a cosmic plan, is it not the height of hubris to think that we can or should interfere? Using red matter, I would create a black hole which would absorb the exploding star. Next, young Spock launches Kirk onto an ice planet where he just happens to land right near a cave that old Spock just happens to be in. Then both of them just happen to be right near where Scotty's at, who just happens to be the guy that invented the idea of transwarp beaming and beaming within a solar system. Both concepts that they're gonna put to use in the next half hour. Too many coincidences? Well, I have an explanation. It was the will of the Force that they all meet, so it makes perfect sense. Kirk and Spock are destined to be shipmates, as it was prophesied that this will bring balance to the Federation. Oh wait, I'm confusing this with Stargate. So the main bad guy Nero, who was named after the CD burning software, worked as some kind of miner on a big ass ship that must have mined whole planets in the future or something. Nero uses his ship to drop the red matter he took from Spock from the future into Vulcan of the past so that he could suck up the planet because he's pissed at Spock. I guess the red matter needs like a ton of heat or energy to turn into a black hole, or else dropping it into the planet's core is sort of pointless. Oh wait, I guess it doesn't. I don't know what's happening. Anyway, whatever. So Nero's motivated by revenge, of course, because Spock didn't save his planet and his wife died. And she looks nothing like a Romulan woman, by the way. Romulan women are ugly-ass broads kind of see in biker bars. Anyway, so if you look at it logically, Nero's motivation is weird and makes no sense. Having your wife on a planet that gets obliterated and then sucked up into a black hole? Well, that gets rid of something they like to call evidence. Ah, I'd love to see Detective Gary Podluski from the Teaneck Police Department retrieve evidence from a black hole. Good luck with that, Gary. Yeah, I'll see you in court, asshole. Anyway, all Spock did was try to help. And unless Nero had some kind of proof that Spock intentionally failed because he hated Romulans, then Nero was mad at Spock for no real reason. In fact, in this timeline, Spock was the guy who was all about reunification with the Romulans, so I'm sure he gave it his best shot. Second, they mentioned that it was the Vulcan Science Academy that initiated the mission. Commissioned by the Vulcan Science Academy. But just like Star Trek Nemesis, the villain now wants to go after Earth, too. He's going after Earth. For no reason other than the audience is from Earth, and then we might care. Now, if you assume that Nero just snapped, and then went totally and completely insane after his wife died, then it all makes perfect sense. 
Crazy people don't have to make sense. Jim, madness has no purpose or reason, but it may have a goal. The problem is, is that Nero has a crew of like 12 or so other Romulans too. All of them can't be just as crazy and driven by convoluted logic too. In many situations like this when a crazy leader goes really off the deep end, someone else will get a bit nervous, as if their plans just might be going a bit too far. Moving them is one thing, killing them all. No one hated them more than you, Golda. The other Romulans appear to have no problems with killing six billion people. Without having that scene where Nero's second-in-command asks if what he's doing is a good idea, they've reduced Romulans to totally mindless monsters, when before they really weren't. I don't know, maybe the black hole scrambled their brains. I know a black hole once tried to scramble my brains, but don't worry, everything turned out well. But you say Romulans were always villains. Well, that's right, but only in the sense that they had like a secretive society. Not all Romulans were bad people. They were as diverse as any other race. And while Romulans would kill and torture to protect their empire, I doubt most would condone genocide on such a grand scale. He's not planning to defeat Earth. He's planning its annihilation. And his sins will mark us and our children for generations. So anyway, we get to the end of the film, and their plan is for the Enterprise to disguise itself in the rings of Saturn, and then Kirk and Spock are gonna beam onto Shinzon's ship from there. So Kirk rescues Pike, the Enterprise saves Spock from missiles, and he crashes the ship into Nero. Spock! So yeah, this ending is pretty much a shoot em up, fight with the bad guy, lots of choking, big explosion ending. But the point of all this is so that Kirk and Spock can finally work together as a team, thus establishing their professional relationship and the beginning of a friendship. This is why this all works for me, because if this climax was too complex or cerebral, it would overshadow the simple fact that this is a character-driven origin story. That and the fact that this whole ending sequence is pretty slick and very well done. It's not as awkward and pathetic as the action in the Next Generation films. Again, I'll recall my gradient spectral graphic. And as some weird guy said, you got classical music and you got rock and roll. Both are good in their own context. But when you get somewhere in the middle, you end up with child banging on a piano. Number eight. References to Star Trek. Star Trek has always referenced itself in one way or another, from one generation to the other. What is it? Well, it's, um, what is it? It is. It is. It's green. It is green. Usually, it'll be a subtle reference that only Trek fans will get. And I'm glad to report that there's a lot of these little moments in the new film. Are you out of your Vulcan mind? Let's take a look at some now. Nurse Chapel reference. There's a brief mention of Nurse Chapel. Nurse Chapel, I need 50 cc's of cortisol. Yes, sir. I don't know if we ever see her, though. The ladder in the hallway. In classic Trek, they had one hallway set, and there was always this yellow ladder there. I think it went up somewhere. In the new movie, we see a similar ladder in the hallway as well. It's a nice little touch in the background. Sulu's warp drive throttle. You may have thought the warp drive throttle was silly. You might have even thought it was kind of like the Enterprise E manual steering column. But in the motion picture, Sulu did indeed have a warp throttle. Pretty cool. Eye lighting. Classic lighting, baby. Classic. Red shirt getting killed on an away mission. Probably the most famous of Star Trek references. Pretty self explanatory. Mind controlling space slugs. An obvious reference to the Wrath of Khan, but they put him in Pike's mouth instead, which is a reference to Star Trek The Next Generation and the mind-controlling slugs that tried to take over the Federation. So in both timelines, Captain Pike still ends up in a wheelchair. In the original- OH MY GOD! What's wrong with your hair? Kirk and the Apple. Kirk eats an apple during the Kobayashi Maru test. This is a reference to the Wrath of Khan when Kirk is eating an apple while discussing how he beat the test. Number 9. So what's next? 
the future of Star Trek. So I haven't read any rumors or anything about what's supposed to be in the next Star Trek film, but I can take an educated guess. It's probably gonna be about Klingons. And maybe have Tribbles in it too. Why? Cause that's the next thing on the list of what the general public knows about Star Trek. You see, they made Romulans the bad guys in this one, because Romulans are less interesting and less known than Klingons. And the focus of the first movie was to get all the characters into place. So let's list the things that your average, everyday Joe knows about Star Trek, just through osmosis alone. Beam me up, Scotty. The Star Trek Enterprise. Dr. Spock. Live long and prosper. AKA the Spock hand thing. Can you do it? LLL, I can. Warp speed. Set phasers to stun. Damn it, Jim, I'm a doctor, not a. He's dead, Jim. Klingons. Kirk fights Spock with the things. Da 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 da. Photon torpedoes. Tribbles. Kirk fights the lizard guy. The people with the half black, half white faces. The reason why Star Trek endured for 40 years was again limitations and quality storytelling. If you ask me what ruined Star Trek, it wasn't the TNG films, it was the Dominion War. A large unfolding plot line about a full scale war was neat, but like my great granddaughter Crystal, it showed us all the goods too soon and left nothing to the imagination. For example, the next generation teased us for seven years. We never got to see the Enterprise-D in a full-out battle to the death with a Romulan warbird. They came close several times, but it never happened, and that's what made it interesting. When the bigger, more epic things started to happen, it began to cheapen it, causing a rapid burnout. The once mighty and feared Klingon bird of prey now had the durability of a TIE fighter, and the terrifying Romulan warbird could now be dissolved away when hit by a laser beam. Then after a few battles, things got boring. In the new film, we see two whole planets blowing up, almost three. We see supernovas, black holes, black holes sucking up supernovas. So what can be blown up next? The galaxy? The universe? The first film kicked off the franchise really well. But if you keep trying to top the previous film, then it's in danger of burning itself out too quickly when you go too far. Star Trek will just need another reboot in five years like everything else. So is a reboot of a reboot still just called a reboot? Or is it a reimagining of a reboot? Or would a reimagining get a reboot?